All right, um, back to lab work. So um, <laughs> blood glucose, um, babies will show us they might be a little low by the little jitteriness. They might have this like shrill, high-pitched cry thing that happens. Um, or they might not have any signs. Sometimes a baby with a decreased temperature with no obvious reasons why it's decreased, we would check a blood glucose and the blood glucose is down too. Um, um, otherwise, we check at-risk kids, kids who are either very large for gestational age or a baby who are small for gestational age or a baby of a diabetic mother. Those babies are used to having sweet blood and now they're no longer getting supplied with it. And so we have to watch their blood sugars to make sure that they can maintain them because babies of diabetic moms, particularly di uh, uncontrolled diabetes, can tank with their blood glucoses. They can be very hypoglycemic um, as they adjust. Every baby, I believe across the United States, definitely in Connecticut, um, gets a metabolic screening. Um, it's, we, uh, you might hear old nurses calling it the PKU test. Um, it's a heel stick and we fill um, five circles with uh, a filter, um, filter paper uh, with the newborn's heel, heel stick blood. Um, we do this, we have to wait until at least 28 hours of age um, and um, simply because it's, it's a metabolic disorders screening. Therefore, they need to have eaten either formula or breast milk in order to create whatever enzyme or lack thereof um, so that we can detect it, blah, 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 blah. And it's not, it used to just be uh, the main one that they were testing for is PKU or phenylketonuria. Um, that's just, now that's just one of over 35 metabolic disorders they're actually testing for um, in that test. So the fact that they have to give all that blood, that five circles of blood, the number of disorders that they can detect is pretty impressive, all right? At the same time, many patients um, uh, agree to having a cystic fibrosis screening. In fact, it's just standard now, cystic fibrosis screening, which is another two circles on fil filter paper sent to a different lab. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty standard, and I think the book it must still say 24 hours. The state of Connecticut just recently, like back in April, ha um, have changed the recommendation to 28 hours or older uh, for the metabolic screening. They get it once before they leave the newborn nursery, uh, before they're discharged home, and then again they repeat the test at two weeks old. It's so important because some of these metabolic disorders, if detected that early, can be treated and managed without, with, with little to no ill effect on the baby. All right, if a baby has PKU and we keep giving it the formula or whatever, they could have some serious trouble um, meta metabolizing or whatever it is that they can't metabolize. Any of those, like galactosemia, say. That's, they can't even breastfeed, uh, breast milk. That's the only medical condition of a newborn that is completely, con that contraindicates um, breast milk. So we need to kind of know that in the first week or so, so that we stop poisoning the kid. Uh, that's pretty strong language, but you know what I mean. <clears throat> We are also, as I mentioned, doing the newborn hearing screenings. Um, we are also in the last, I don't know how many years we've been doing it, less than 10, I would say, doing um, critical congenital heart defect screening, CCHD, we call it. Uh, we found that if we check the baby's oxygen saturation in the right hand, which is above the heart, and we check post-heart, post-ductal, they say, um, in one of their lower extremities. If there's a huge difference between above the heart and below the heart, 
Um, that is indicative of one of these congenital heart defects that usually don't rear their ugly heads for a couple of weeks. Well, where are these babies a couple of weeks from birth? Home. Home, yeah. No time to have them rear their ugly head, right? So, um, because we've figured this out, we're, we're finding these babies in the newborn nursery, so to speak, and sending them for cardiac consults right after discharge and so that they can find and manage that heart defect before it uh, pro proclaims its presence. All right, does that make sense? So um, in terms of things going a little wrong in that whole transition from intra to extra uterine life, um, respiratory, um, respiratory symptoms in a newborn can be kind of subtle, right? Um, certainly we worry about bradypnea, which is the respiratory rate less than 25. Tachypnea, which is usually more common um, of a complication, and that is when the respiratory rate goes above 60, sustained. I mean, if the kid's screaming and for a minute they're, they're breathing at 62, beats, uh, 62 breaths per minute, fine, but at a calm rate, if they're still breathing that quickly, that's too much. They may have abnormal breath sounds, crackles, wheezing. I don't hear it too much, but it can happen. Grunting, I hear pretty frequently. Um, but it doesn't sound like an adult grunting. A, a, a newborn baby grunt sounds like a coo. Oh, isn't that cute? The baby's cooing. No. <laughs> Actually, it's not cute. It's grunting. All right. <laughs> See how it's important to, that subtleness can be, that subtlety um, can really, what it does is the baby's going to declare themselves. They're going to get really tired of compensating for the fact that they're, they're not getting enough oxygen by either breathing really quickly, <sighs> doing that, grunting, Flaring their uh, nasal flaring or retractions. Retractions are in their intercostal space or sternal retractions. So they're using their ancillary muscles to try to really expand their lungs. It's subtle though. It's very subtle. And if we're not looking for it, the baby is going to keep doing it and then get really tired. And then not be quite so subtle by like maybe not breathing at all. So... Um, it's really important for the newborn nurse <laughs> to watch for these subtle signs <clears throat> of respiratory distress. These are just, uh, as I mentioned, nasal flaring, sternal retractions, grunting, seesaw respirations, literally abdomen, chest, abdomen, chest, like they're trying really, really hard to just get that, those lungs expanded, all right, in a rate above or below the, the normal range. Those are the retractions. I don't know if you can see from your vantage point, um, the intercostal retractions, the uh, ancillary muscles are working really hard. So we know the temperature should be <coughs> assessed axillary. Uh, we can do it rectally if those, those numbers are off or by skin probe. Um, the uh, tympanic, uh, is the tympanic is a good um, or accurate measure of body temperature, but a newborn baby's ear is too small to really get a good reading, so that's why we avoid that uh, method for a newborn. But my gosh, if I had a tympanic thermometer when my daughter was a toddler, it would have saved me a lot of trouble. I don't know if it was the mercury thermometers at that point, but... Try getting a toddler, you've got some of you know, to, to stay still <laughs> long enough to either axillary or rectal temp. Oh, gosh. Those, uh, those are those ones that go across the forehead, temporal ones or whatever. Anyways. Really, one of our biggest um, priorities, if you will, of uh, newborn care, particularly initially, um, with certainly within the first 24 hours, firstly, uh, within the first hour of life, is to provide a neutral thermal environment, all right? We do not want this baby 
getting too cold. We do not want this baby getting too hot. But too cold sends them down a spiraling path, all right? Too cold means that they're working really, really hard to try to keep their body, to maintain their body temperature. Uh, they're burning off all what little brown fat they have. Um, now they're gonna drop their sugar because they, they don't have any body fuel left, all right? So we're gonna um, have trouble maintaining our sugars, our temperature, and our blood sugar. Did I say that already? Blood sugar, temperature, and then if a low blood sugar happens and gets extreme, they could go into respiratory distress at all. A healthy newborn could go down this spiraling, a downward spiral simply by getting too cold. That's a shame, isn't it? So a goal of initial nursing care of a well newborn is to maintain that neutral thermal environment. What kinds of things um, affect the fact that, uh, first of all, a newborn baby literally just came from an, uh, from an all-you-can-eat kind of buffet, right? Like, they didn't have to do much for themselves, pretty much. Mom kept them warm. Mom kept them fed. Mom kept them oxygenated, right? Now they're out in the world having to do it all on their own. Um, and different things can affect that. All right, so just the initial, okay, I gotta do this on my own thing. And then you think about it, they have less subcutaneous fat. Um, their blood vessels are so much closer to the surface, right? So if, they're, if they catch a chill, well, that could affect their actual core temperature because their blood is so much closer, they don't have the insulation uh, between the outside world um, and their, their inside workings, all right? Thankfully, most, Healthy newborns have that flexed posture that I spoke of, and that just kind of protects them and keeps them keeps as much warmth as possible um, to stay within them, okay? Um, but it definitely has to be a priority because we do not want cold stress, all right? That brown fat I talked about, if they're really preterm, they don't even have that much brown fat, all right? So it's even more important to maintain that environment for them. Hypothermia, uh, we want to prevent it. I would say, uh, say, there were, say somebody asked you, what's the first thing you do for a newborn baby? The first thing you do for a newborn baby is dry them off and put on a hat. Right? Dry them off and remove the wet blankets. Right? Put a hat on them. And, you know, dry, try to dry their head if, off as well. So you don't want a wet head underneath a hat. But All right. Wrap them, wrap them in a blanket or put them skin to skin in a blanket over them, all right? If they can't be uh, skin to skin with mom, uh, put them on the radiant warmer, that, that um, warming table, if you will, all right? But mom's skin to skin is really the, the best for a number of reasons. One being, we know it's going to be a, a constant, steady 98.6, 98.7-ish, right? You should hope. Babies can lose heat in a couple of different ways. I would be very, very familiar with these four particular ways of heat loss. Who has a convection oven? All right, convection ovens heat and cook food with warm air circulating around the food, right? Well, cold air circulating around a baby is going to cool them off pretty quick, all right? That's convection, heat loss by convection. Conduction. Direct contact with a colder surface. You think, no big deal, right? What are we doing? Baby's born. If they're not on mom, what are we doing? We put them on a cold scale. We're taking a, a stethoscope, which is a significant portion of their chest, especially if it's an adult stethoscope, maybe even like a third of their chest size. And if that thing's cold and we're keeping them on there for over a minute, that's direct contact with a colder surface, isn't it? All right? In the newborn world, we are constantly preheating. We're constantly preheating uh, the crib mattress on the warmer. Um, we have warm blankets everywhere. If we can put a warm blanket down on the scale, then zero it, and then put the baby down on it, um, that's one less worry um, or one less um, hard work for the baby. They're not gonna lose 
heat simply by being weighed. All right, we can warm our stethoscopes up a little bit before putting it on the baby's chest. All of these things would, will help prevent heat loss from conduction. Evaporation is keeping them wet, all right? That's why we dry them off very good and then remove those wet blankets. Uh, did I mention dry them off and remove wet blankets? Very, very important. Radiation is a warm object that gets cools off with a cooler object just close to them, not touching them, but just nearby. No matter how many times you ask, a baby will never state their name and date of birth. <laughs> I've done a test. I've done a study. It's, in, it's um, fairly informal. Not published, but a study nonetheless. I've never, I repeat, 0% of newborns asked have stated their name and date of birth. Therefore, before... <laughs> <laughs> Before that baby steps away from that mother, you best have ID bands on the mom and baby that match. All right? We have special ID bands for both, two for baby. Usually they're on their both ankles. Sometimes um, one is on the ankle, one is on a wrist, but generally they're on the ankles. Two on the baby, one on mom, one on dad or identified support person, all right? These have mom's name or last name, baby, gender, time and date of birth, and mom's medical record number, because we know it in advance. There's a pre-printed number on the ID bands, on all four of those ID bands, and they match. We checked, didn't we? We checked ID bands, um, so every shift, Every time you're taking a baby away from mom, every time you're bringing a baby back to a mom, every time you're going to do anything on the baby, just like when you would check mom's ID band, right? Or scan the ID band for this and that. You're checking uh, baby's ID band. And um, uh, just matching it up, all right, to the, either the medical record or the parent that you're giving the child to. This is your ticket in, too, all right? Back when babies went to the nursery from time to time, um, you know, somebody might come to the nursery to pick up their baby. You know, maybe mom would come to the nursery to pick up their baby. You, you match the ID band. Dad comes, takes the baby. Dad, I had, there's people who have left the hospital, you know, like dad went off to work or whatever. The band was bothering them, so they cut it off. Guess what they did? They no longer have their ticket in. Oh, but here it is. I kept it. It doesn't matter. We put it on your wrist, and it's not on your wrist anymore. We cannot assume you are the dad. Sorry. <laughs> That's why we tell them, do not take this off. This is your ticket in. This is your ticket to your kid. They cannot be the ones transporting the babies back and forth from mom's room to the uh, nursery. We cannot hand over a, any, that baby to anybody other than the ones who have the ID bands on. Grandma could have been in the delivery room with me all day the day before. We wept hugging after the birth together. <laughs> I'm in the nursery for some reason with her baby. That very same woman comes, gives me a hug because we've bonded, and then goes to to ask, can I bring the baby back to mom? Sorry. Nope. Get it? Pretty important. Uh, think about this, too. Even if I'm not with mom and I say I'm with baby, I always, because uh, babies tend to have a crib card, baby boy Smith, mom's name, date, time and date of birth, maybe their weight. You know, just it's, it's informal. It's, it doesn't mean anything official. Uh, but it's a quick way to see whose cribs are whose, right? Um, when I'm dealing with a baby, um, I'm checking the baby to the crib tag, too. I want to make sure the right baby's in the right crib. This means little nowadays, because babies stay in the room, and there's only one baby, generally. But in a crowded nursery, can you see where that might be a problem? 
All right? And so you might wheel a baby in. Oh, it says Baby Boy Smith. I'm going to Smith's room. Yeah, well, that's not Baby Boy Smith. You know, once you get in there, it could just save some embarrassment. If there was a big, busy nursery. Like I said, that's another good reason for rooming in. There's no mix-up of any babies. I've never mixed up a baby, but I can see how it could happen. You know, you're, uh, like again, a crowded nursery. You're at the scale with the baby. Um, somebody is at the other scale with another baby, and somebody is going by to, to get around, and, you know, and they move the crib a little bit to, to come past, and then when you come back, you put the baby in the wrong crib. You see how it happened? Um, I've read things about, you know, moms discovering that it's not their baby, like as they're nursing their baby, and they're like, this baby doesn't really look like my baby. Harmful? Possibly not. But this is a little embarrassing, if, if not completely devastating to whoever's involved. Yeah? Um, do most of the hospitals that you send in also have the band for the baby that if they pass a certain point? So infant security. Most hospitals have some sort of infant security system. Um, many of them are, are baby specific. So yeah, there's a there's a an alarm tag, mm -hmm. infant security tag on the baby, whether it's um, wrapped around their ankle, attached to their calf, or on their um, umbilical cord clamp. I've seen that as well. Um, whatever it's on the baby. Um, these ID, these security tags, it's more than just the tag, it's the band that they use to attach it also for some systems. If you cut the band, it makes a big loud noise, <laughs> hospital wide, or at least unit wide. Um, if the um, band um, does not have good um, contact with the baby's skin, it will also alarm like if it slips off, which is pretty common actually with the weight loss of the band that used to fit right, it gets a little loose, it can come off. So that will alarm if the, there's been a breach in uh, it being on the baby. But if you try to take that baby with the band, that ID or that uh, security tag on them off the unit, that's, a, that's, a, that's asking for trouble. Lots of systems, the more sophisticated system will not only alarm and set off infant security code, um, at some hospitals, I know Hartford Hospital, it locks all egress doors and stops the elevator. Yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's embarrassing when you forget to take the tag out of your pocket after discharge and you walk through the door yourself. Um, <laughs> but what it does is it limits the uh, uh, abductor's ability to get off the unit, even if they've gotten the baby that far. <laughs> so other infant security measures, including um, education, education, education. Every system can be fooled, if you will, because um, it's all about humans, right? Um, educate the parents to not just give the baby over to whoever looks like their hospital employee. Mm -hmm. Comes in with, with a white coat and scrubs. I'm here to take your baby to the nursery for some tests. Okay, boom, baby's gone. Hasn't happened in a long time, but it still happens. ID badges. Um, my ID for Griffin looks a little bit different, and I'm not going to tell you what is different about it because that's part of the system. But my ID badge looks different than somebody in a different department in the hospital. Um, and the patients are to know not to give their baby over to anybody. It doesn't matter if they have a hospital badge. The hospital badge has to be identified as the baby, the baby nurses, all right? The, baby, the staff of the maternity unit. So... Um, sometimes it's a color, a border color around the picture. Sometimes it's the background of the picture. Sometimes it's a little heart or a little rubber ducky in the corner of the eye. There's some identifying factor on the ID itself 
the employee ID um, that is supposed to also um, uh, be indicative and, and help the parents decide who they can give their baby to, who they can trust their baby with and who they can't. Is there a reason why a parent can't give their baby to Um, outside of the room, no, no, uh, unless mom is unable, back in, it still happens, like the baby, we try not to move the scales around too much, because that um, can screw up the calibration of the scale, I mean, ideally, we bring this, the nursery to the baby to do rounds, but, so sometimes the baby could come out to the nursery just for their daily weight. And for the screening tests, it's a quieter environment in the nursery for that. They're welcome to come along with the baby. Um, sometimes the baby has to go off the unit for some radiology tests, like an x-ray or an ultrasound, um, at which point they have to be accompanied by the specially designated nurse, um, and their parents can also accompany them. Mom might might have just had a c-section so that you know that might not be possible and when we can do portable x-ray we do um you know they might need a chest x-ray they will come to us as opposed to the baby going to the x-ray we try to limit any movement of the baby outside of the secured area um, most doctors will not um for a circumcision just simply because it's maybe a little too much pressure for them, but it's just upsetting. Um, and they've had they've passed out, and we don't need that extra paperwork. <laughs> um, I don't know. Some some docs will allow um, will will allow a parent in there, but the doctor's not paying attention. It's the nurse who has to pay attention to the parent because. Even nursing students have dropped during a circumcision. So I just tell them I'm going to be there. I tell them everything I'm going to do to keep their baby comfortable and safe. Um, and then I go back and say, most often I can tell them, do you know your baby fell asleep in the middle of a circumcision? That's when I know uh, we've done our job well, is that the baby literally is quiet and somewhat sleeping during the procedure. Um, that, that never used to be the case. That's why I'm still so proud when that actually happens to the babies I'm caring for. <laughs> Speaking of sleeping and whatnot, there are, just like adults, uh, babies do have sleep-wake cycles, okay? Anywhere from deep sleep to extreme irritability. I like the pictures. Um, and you, we can just go, with, I mean, these are pretty, pretty standard pretty stuff for no matter what size human being you're talking about. The nice deep sleep, great for resting, other people resting. Not so great if you're trying to feed the baby though, right? Just this, you can lead a horse to water, but this baby ain't gonna drink. All right, the light sleep, eh, you might be able to arouse them enough to eat if, the, if it's time to eat, all right? Um, drowsy, semi-alert, good time. Ah, I love this active alert period. Even just looking at the picture makes my heart happy. Clearly, I'm in the right business, right? I love those newborns. Wide awake, you know? <laughs> looking around, like, look, like old, look like old men. <laughs> A newborn, but you can't, I, depending on what book you read or who you ask, you cannot spoil a newborn baby, all right? Do you have your own parenting philosophy? And that's fine. But a newborn baby is not manipulating you like the <laughs> slightly older baby. Those <laughs> slightly older babies know what the heck they're doing. All right? They know how to manipulate their mothers or their fathers or their grandmas. All right? A newborn baby cries because it needs something. It just mean, might mean that they need some stimulation because they're bored. It doesn't necessarily mean they're in danger, but they might be hungry, they might be cold, they might be, they might be um, needing just some comfort, all right, to you know, cuddle up a little bit to help fall asleep. They, they might be bored, but more or less, it's probably one of those other things that they need tending to, all right? 
you tell um, you tell all new parents, particularly, um, and probably some of you will remember. You just have a checklist when you first start. You just have a checklist. Check the diaper. Check the you know. Is it time to eat? Is it you know? Wrap them back up. You just have a checklist that you go down um, when a, when your newborn is crying. Before you know it, and without even being aware of it happening, a mom and dad and any close caregiver probably can recognize the quality of the cry and know, oh, he has a wet diaper. And it's pretty, you can't, you can't describe the difference between the wet diaper cry and the hungry cry you can, or anything like that, but you just know, you know? And you know your baby's cry over somebody other some other babies cry. It's pretty, it's pretty fascinating. Um, I was, I don't know if I told you that. I don't think I told you the story. My um, daughter was at that very self-centered age of like 10 or whatever. <laughs> and we were at my parents' house. My father, uh, she was born with the uh, video camera age, you know, always with the little handheld camcorders, you know. My dad had that thing like up and video recording his granddaughter at every opportunity uh, when she was a baby, like a newborn baby. Um, And as they got older, just real, just priceless videos um, that uh, that we have. Well, at that age of 10 or so, can I watch the baby videos or whatever? So they're down, Pop Pop and Tori are downstairs digging into the the video files, mom and I are upstairs just having a little chat. Television, just like, I don't know, probably some of your parents, is on a very high volume. And then, (laughs) I don't know what that's about, (laughs) right? Mom and I are upstairs talking away, doing whatever. All of a sudden, I hear my baby crying. And it's been 10 years since I heard that cry. But I was just talking, and I immediately, like I knew that was my baby crying. It was very powerful, it was a powerful moment. And it stopped me in my tracks, like, now I knew. <laughs> it couldn't possibly actually be my baby crying, because <laughs> my baby was 10 years old, but it was something else. I'm like, I knew that was my baby. It was pretty cool. Anyways. Um, nonetheless, a newborn baby's cry is eliciting help, is asking for something. What comes out, what goes in must come out, Right? So if a, a mom asks you, how do I know my baby's getting enough? Especially with the breastfeeding moms, right? They don't have a measured bottle to see how much is going out. You tell them once breastfeeding is established and the, the full milk is in, I'll probably do like two weeks, uh, six to ten wet, wet diapers a day is the standard response. What goes in must come out. Um, so that's how we know they're getting enough is when they have these wet, wet, wet diapers. All right. They, depending on how they're feeding, will depend on how how often they poop the, in those diapers. Um, the first poop that we have is called meconium, and it's like this black tarry substance that's pretty <clears throat> sticky. The only trade off is that it doesn't smell like poop. Yeah, I don't know if that's a trade off or not, but. Um, this meconium is formed when they're in utero, all right? So they got a belly full of it before they're born. Uh, so they could poop quite a bit initially, and it's not uh, a reflection of how much they're taking in. It's just what was in there to start, okay? As, they, as it mixes with whatever they're eating, breast milk or formula, um, we call it, uh, it goes from that dark, tarry meconium to a transitional stool, to a light green brown stool to uh, for breastfeeding um, breastfeeding poop is like a bright yellow like a mustard color like a French's mustard so <laughs> like something you'd... <laughs> so sorry so sorry that's the first food though I think I've ruined right this lecture Scales. Scales. no in this lecture I try I try to at least one food a class so mustard it is folks oh wait a minute i think i have another one. Oh no no that's in a couple lectures right there mustard all right <clears throat> anyways a couple meds uh every baby gets the two state of connecticut mandated and i think every state in the united states i'm not sure but 
Two medications are state mandated. It's erythromycin ointment, which is 0.5% um, in both eyes. Um, this is to uh, battle any syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, um, that might ha they might have contracted in the chute on the way out. All right. Um, we used to put silver nitrate in the baby's eyes, which was, was effective, but rather harsh. Um, my baby pictures looked like I was <laughs> I lost a boxing match. <laughs> my twin looked worse, so apparently I'm the one who won. <laughs> no, they're just swollen shut because of the silver nitrate. No infections, but really pretty baby pictures. Um, the other med is vitamin K. It's a shot that we give um, in the vastus lateralis is the, the thigh muscle. That's the, the most, that is the preferred and really the only m location for um, IM injections on a baby is the thigh muscle. Vitamin K, we need vitamin K as human beings to help with blood clotting, right? Turns out, we manufacture our own vitamin K using the normal floral bacteria in our gut as adults, as young, young babies even can make their own vitamin K. But a newborn baby's gut is completely sterile until we start introducing breast milk or formula into their GI system, all right? So there is no normal flora. So we do not have any vitamin K in our system um, for the first 24 hours or so. Well, heck of a time to have uh, decreased clotting factors, right? Heads getting all smushed and everything. Probably a good idea. Circumcisions all. We probably should give the baby a little boost of vitamin K <clears throat> until they can start manufacturing their own. That's what that's about. All right? So erythromycin ointment to battle any infection and vitamin K. A lot of hospitals are offering and, and encouraging the first hepatitis B vaccine in the series of three, um, starting right at, at, right at birth. So they might get the ointment and a shot in each leg. We call it, uh, I don't know, most hospitals, they might say, a uh, uh, baby's been weighed and, and uh, tempt, but still needs eyes and thighs. <laughs> eyes and thighs is what we call the meds on a baby. Just throwing that out. So then when you, when you get to the nurse, you'll be like, oh, do the eyes and thighs done yet? Or can I, uh, you know, excuse me, that you're in the nursery nurses. Anyways, best to give, uh, if they have two legs and two shots, give them in different legs, okay? Nothing like, nothing like giving us, I mean, really, use them in both eyes. Lots of places are, will try to be very consistent. Hepatitis B is in the liver side, get it? So the right thigh for hepatitis, and spleen, blood, cloth, something like that, yeah. vitamin K in the left. Vitamin K in the left, hepatitis in the right. That's the standard for most hospitals that I've been in, in the recent past. But always confirm, if you're giving the hepatitis B vaccine, like later in the newborn's life, Go back and look to see where they had the vitamin K at birth. There's a vastus lateralis. That's the place to go. All right. So, like I said, we know who we're dealing with most often. At least we have a little warning ahead of time. So we're going to review mom's information. Most often a newborn's chart um, has the prenatal record, mom's prenatal record in it. All right, so that's how important that is. Um, we want to know um, what the due date was and all any trouble along the way, any family history of trouble. We're gonna so we're gonna weigh and measure and vital sign. We might do the hematocrit, most likely not. Blood glucose certainly if it's indicated or if baby's showing us signs that there's trouble. So uh, and the. In addition to the goal of maintaining the neutral thermal environment, we certainly want to make sure they they can breathe on their own, right? A nice clear airway, right? Um, stable vital signs. Chapter twenty five. 
Kubor Nutrition. I'm not going to go into too much de detail here. I think the bottom line is, um, in these, in most parts of this country, you can you have access to clean water. Most parts, not all. All right. Um, and if we have the education and the resources, formula fed babies, it can be safe. It can be safe. All right. The most important factor in a feeding, in my opinion, is a healthy, is a healthy, happy mother. All right. Breastfeeding um, evidence shows that breast milk is the healthiest form of nutrition for a baby. Yes. Um, breast milk has the ideal um, composition, if you will, of nutrients, fat, um, protein, sugar. It has the ideal um, complement for the baby and adjusts based on age and what bacteria is coming through the baby. They say that there's some antibodies that the breast milk will form based on the um, the bacteria that the baby has in the saliva. I mean, it's a pretty cool system if it's all working right. Um, and it's pretty convenient most often for a mom to breastfeed. There's no formula. It's cheaper, way cheaper. I will say that. I don't know. How much is a, a can of formula these days? Does anyone know? Thirty dollars. That's a. I'd breastfeed just for that. <laughs> I did actually. I don't know how. I don't remember how much. Uh, I got free formula from the formula rep when I was breastfeeding, but. Um, that sounds like a lot of free samples. Absolutely, we are not allowed to in the hospital anymore, especially the baby-friendly hospitals, because um, it's about, all about breastfeeding. And I get it, um, but yeah, lots of free formula because they want you to use their formula so that when when those free samples run out, you're still buying the $30 can of formula. Yeah. So the best form of feeding is breast milk. I get it. Um, I mentioned last week, and I'm going to mention again, and some of you who went to the breastfeeding class, I know at Griffin, I was stressed to you how it's not easy. It's not easy to, to breastfeed, especially in the first few weeks. Yes, some things are instinct. Yes, and the body's supposed to kind of take over and do what it's supposed to do for giving it the right signals and all that. But there's some women who it's, it's hard, both physically hard or emotionally hard. Okay. Say a woman was uh, sexually abused as she was, um, uh, as her uh, puberty was emerging, right? And she associates her breasts with that trauma. Should that woman breastfeed? If she wants to, that's fine. But should I pressure her to? Absolutely not. So maybe she's pressured into it and she feels guilty for not doing it. So she does it. And she's reliving the trauma every time she puts that baby to her breast. Is that a healthy situation for mom or baby? No. And that maybe is extreme. But these are the things we need to, to keep in mind. Uh, especially if a mom seems hesitant or... Um, unwilling to, whatever it is, we need to make sure mom is well informed and then given the freedom to choose and the support to do so. Um, I will step off my soapbox now. Um, you can go through um, both the chapter as well as these PowerPoints to um, get further detail on newborn nutrition um, if it suits you. Um, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I will say the initial feeding should be in that first um, reactive, reactive time for a breastfed baby. So their suck is amazingly strong, uh, startlingly strong to a lot of new moms. Like, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so uh, bottle feeding babies can wait because nutritionally they don't need it. But for bonding purposes, it's just a great time to initiate um, but they have to learn. Both mom and baby have to learn, all right? It has to become um, the well-oiled machine that it can be, um, but uh, and we need to give them the education and the support and um, set them up for success um, in however they choose to feed their baby. Um, 